Now you can. Good. So w w when we planned this meeting, um, we decided that there would be a rather wide spectrum of uh, models covered, so from from single neurons to groups of neurons, and uh, it, but it was important to to give you a, at least a rough idea of how experiments are done to get the data at the different levels. And that's why uh, I suggested to, to have a real physiologist doing recording of single cells with morphology. And that's why uh, I asked Audrey to give us a few talks uh, about this, this um, important uh, part of the, of the problems we will study in this uh, workshop. So uh, you will be hearing now a lot about what actual neurons look like. You will see that it's kind of complicated and uh, how hard it is to, to get the data uh, about these neurons. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for Antonio and Christophe for inviting me today. And um, I'm uh, not a mathematician, and I don't claim to, um, to uh, really um, know very much about it. But what I would like to, um, to do, I'm happy to learn, but also I would like to give you an impression of like, what is um, uh, data look like. And really for like, uh, following your talk, I think it's important for you to know what um, to put in your model. And I understand that the model should be simple and has to be simple, but the question is, is how or which parameters should be included to that model and, and really what can be included and what should be included. So which parameters are really important for you to add to it and uh, which parameter maybe you should just forget about. And, uh, and it's all about realism that you talk about uh, this morning is how realistic the model should be and which really parameter and well, data-driven um, uh, model um, should be included in, that, um, in this model. So today, I, um, well, I'm going to give you a series of three lectures. So the first one will be on the electrophysiological techniques. So this is a very basic um, uh, lecture on how we record neurons in vivo, in cell cultures, and slices. So we, uh, we are going to, um, I'm going to tell you about the recordings, like really in vivo, so what should it be? Um, um, how can we record from like a large population of cells and go down into how we can uh, record from like single neurons and which data can we get from that. So tomorrow I will give you a quantitative analysis. So which kind of data can we get from those experiments? And uh, finally on Wednesday morning, I will tell you about what we know um, so far about the cortex, what we know about connections in the cortex, can, can, what can we know um, about the connection in the hippocampus? So to start with, um, I would like to tell you about the uh, recording of neuronal um, activity. So really, um, I'm going to start with what, how can we record neuronal um, activity in uh, vivo, so really a large, a very large scale neuronal uh, populations. And we are going to, um, to go through um, how to record extracellularly. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the talk, I will uh, uh, really talk to you about how can we record from individual neurons and which information can we get from um, those studies. So, um, the first part is recording of a very large scale neuronal population. So how can you record from uh, um, really a lot of neuron in one go? So the first one will be the EEG, but I guess uh, Claudia will talk to you a little bit more um, about it. And um, so this... You can uh, um, add uh, electrodes into the scalp of uh, a patient and be able to record from waves, 
of um, uh, neuronal activity. And um, this EEG could be um, or was um, replaced by the fMRI, some functional magnetic resonance uh, uh, imaging that is really um, looking at the changes in the blood flow associated with synaptic activity. And finally, you can record from a large uh, population of neurons with um, MEG, so magnetic uh, encephalography, and uh, that will uh, measure the magnetic field uh, of uh, neurons. So this is really a large, very large scale on neuronal population, and I'm not going to go through uh, um, in a lot of details, but uh, what I would like to uh, really focus on will be um, how to record from uh, a large population of uh, neurons by uh, using electro extracellular recordings. So this is very uh, simple um, schematic of the, uh, how to record from those neurons. So you have a cell and you add um, um, uh, extracellular electrodes really close to the cell and you will be able to record the, um, the activity or the electrical um, activity of the cell. So these recordings are low signal to noise ratio and there are um, uh, you use a glass micropipette or metal microelectrodes uh, made of platinum or tungsten. And uh, really the uh, disadvantage of this technique compared to intracellular recordings of individual neurons is you will be able to only record action potential. So if we look at... Um, this uh, cartoon by uh, Spira et I and, uh, in 2013 that will give you um, a little presentation of the, the cell. So one recording with intracellular and one with uh, extracellular uh, electrodes. So on the left there um, is a recording of a neuron intracellularly and on the right is uh, the recording of um, the extracellular electrodes. So when you look at the intracellular recording, so the action potential elicited in intracellularly, you can only record field potential with the extracellular electrodes. So from those recordings, you will be able to uh, only record action potential, but not um, sub-threshold synaptic events. So, for example, if the, the same cell receive uh, inputs from um, like excitatory cells or inhibitory cells that will, um, that will uh, so this cell will receive uh, EPSP or IPSP, you will not be able to record it from uh, extracellular electrodes. This um, extracellular uh, recording can be done with uh, MEA, so this is a microelectrode array, which is um, this uh, little um, plaque here, and this can be done um, in vivo and in vitro. And uh, the um, idea behind it is like each of these points is an electrode, and each electrode can be um, are able to actually uh, record and stimulate um, inside um, inside the, the like, or to record the um, the uh, neural activity as a whole. So uh, this is what you can see here. So this, like each of the square is a recording of a, a cell. So some cells will respond. Um, following the uh, activation or stimulation, and some cell will not. So, uh, so each cell, this is an example of um, the waveform uh, recorded by one of these electrodes. So this system is uh, becoming uh, very popular, and uh, now even when with like the, the technology, you can record from the MEA from 4,096 electrodes at the same time. So this is uh, really the technology that uh, uh, people like to use to have uh, an idea of uh, very um, recording of a, a large population of neurons where you can actually activate one point and record 
from the rest. So in terms of neural activity, it's very important. And you can do it in vitro, in slices, and in culture. So cell cultures can be grown into the MEA. And uh, you can record from different, um, different cells and just record the neural activity. And you can do it in vivo. So the MEA will be implanted into the brain and will be able to, um, to uh, get the new, new activity from there. Electrodes, electrodes, groups of neurons. But, but I mean, the, this MEA are very, very small, so it's just, uh, but now, well, I mean, the electrodes, there's 4,000 electrodes, so 4,000 points that you can record at the same time. So, so let's say uh, with your electrode, you will have a, a number of neurons around, so you can actually uh, um, uh, record the, uh, the activity from that. And, uh, but um, I think this, uh, this recording from MEA is uh, becoming very, uh, very popular and will, we'll, uh, with the technology, will uh, we'll add to, um, to really recording from neural activity. But this is still extracellular, so you don't know it, you're not penetrating any cells, or you might, but just like you're recording like from waveform from those cells. Sorry? Yes, yeah. So um, a novel approach using this um, MEA um, just came out uh, in 2013. And uh, this is really a, a variation of the MEA where they, uh, they use the, the golf mushroom shaped microelectrode like this. And they can grow cells onto those MEA. So the cells will go around those mushrooms and you will be able to record the, um, the electrical activity from, uh, from them. So here is a little diagram. So the neuron two was like, um, uh, in, well, I say impaled, but uh, reorganized around these gold mushroom shape electrodes. And they uh, record it from uh, intracellularly from a neuron that are next to, next to it. And with this um, um, in-cell recordings, you are able to record of um, uh, substratial synaptic events. So as I said, like the extracellular uh, microelectrode will not, uh, will not uh, record from those EPSP or IPSP, but with this uh, uh, gold mushroom shaped microelectrode, you will be able to. And uh, the, uh, with the eye signal to noise ratio. So the, uh, the noise level will be, uh, will be lower and will be almost similar to, uh, to to the one that you can have for intracellular recordings. So this um, uh, gold mushroom shape microelectrode or in-cell recordings is really uh, another way to record uh, from cells extracellularly but with a low noise level and, uh, and uh, you are able to, uh, to, use, uh, to record from substratial synaptic activity. So if now we, um, we look at the intracellular recording, so you want to uh, record from a single neuron, individual neurons, and you, uh, you may want um, to record from uh, the connections uh, between those neurons. So there are two types of intracellular recordings that you can do. So you can either use a sharp electrodes or patch electrodes. So, and I will go through like the, the two different types um, in a minute. So, um, sharp electrodes are really, really sharp electrodes that uh, are um, have uh, high resistance but are very, very small in diameter, and uh, patch electrodes are uh, a, a bit bigger. So, you can either record the uh, uh, the change in the voltage. And that's what we call the current clamp. So you measure the membrane potential by injecting a current into a cell through a recording electrodes, and you will be able to record the action potential of the cell. Or you can use the voltage clamp 
configuration, which is a membrane potential is clamped at a level determined by the experimenter. So usually for a cell would be minus 60 or minus 70, depending on what you want to look at. And you measure um, uh, the ionic current. So either you, you're measuring the, uh, the current or you're measuring the voltage, and uh, this is what we call current clamp or voltage clamp. So for the patch clamp uh, intracellular recordings, so what you do is you, um, you have a patch uh, electrode that you go, um, you put in contact into, uh, into a cell and you record uh, from the patch pipette, which are uh, one micrometer diameter and have a low resistance. And um, you are able to have a high signal to noise ratio. And um, in terms of slices, so this patch um, intracellular recording can be done in cultures or into on slices. And the slices will be about 300 to 350 micrometer. And this is very important if you think about connections between neurons. So with uh, a slices of 300 or 350 microliter, micrometer, you, uh, you, were, you are going to cut some of the cells. So you might lose some of the connection that, uh, that could, be, um, could be very important. And you are able to record a, a single ion channels. So depending on the configuration of the uh, patch clamp, um, recordings, you will be able to, um, to have different type of data. So there are different configuration in the patch clamp intracellular recordings. So that's what we call a cell attached patch, inside out patch, and outside out, or all cell or perforated patch. So I don't know how much you know about all these configurations, so I wanted to give you an idea of what it's like to record from these neurons. So I'd say this is a cell and this is the pipette. So the pipette is placed uh, just really in contact of the cell and will form a gigacil. So you will have a seal between the, uh, the pipettes and the cell, and uh, um, you apply some suction to get the uh, gigacil between the, the pipettes and the cell. The um, gigacil has to be, um, to be uh, very well, like formed very well, and that will um, have an influence on the noise that you will record. So this is what we call the cell attached configuration where the, the electrode is just in contact of the cell with a gigacil giga form. It, here, oh, I'll come back to it in a minute. <laughs> um, so what, to get into the all cell configurations, you have to apply a suction um, from uh, the pipette like this to break the membrane and you go into a whole cell configuration. So you will be able to record from the cell as a whole um, without um, any, um, any noise or really a very, very low noise. But this is here is really a representation of the membrane with different type of receptors. So what's happening is when you have a neurotransmitter release, this receptor will open and you will be able to record the, um, the activity or the ion, like the currents, um, uh, depending on the number of channels that will open. And, uh, and this activity will, uh, uh, will be recording as shown. So you have release of neurotransmitter, the receptor open, and you are able to record the, the currents of the number of channels open, then the, the channels will close and the recording will go back to normal. So really, this is the uh, all cell configurations. You are able to record from single channels or multiple channels, depending on what you're looking at. And, um, and this is uh, really the main um, configuration that you can use. From the cell attached 
configuration like this. So if you remember, the, the, um, the pipette is uh, um, contact the cell and you have a gigacil. So if you uh, retract the pipette from the cell, you, uh, you will go into the inside out configuration. So where you can manipulate the environment at the intracellular surface of the membrane. So this is used if you want to, um, to really do some pharmacology so you have access to the intracellular membrane and, uh, and, uh, and uh, have another configuration um, uh, compared to the whole cell configuration. From the um, whole cell configuration, if you retract the pipette, some of the membrane will, um, will stay attached. This two bits of dendrites will fold and reform a membrane at the tip of the pipettes. And in this configuration, you, uh, which is called outside out configuration, you will be able to manipulate the environment at the extracellular surface. So depending on the questions, you will be able to um, uh, to either record from or to manipulate the intracellular or the extracellular. But the main configuration that is used uh, is, uh, is probably the all cell configuration. So as I said, this um, technique um, uh, is a, a, a high um, noise, uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. The only disadvantage of this technique is you have an alteration of the intracellular content. So when uh, the uh, solution inside the pipette will mix into, with the solution inside the cell, and then you alterate um, the intracellular content that way. If you don't want that, uh, you can uh, do uh, or, or perform a perforated patch where you add the antifungal and antibiotic agent inside the pipette that will create some pores in the membrane and you will be able to record the cell while retaining intracellular mechanism. Um, this technique compared to whole cell configuration will give you a higher resistance and higher noise. So, uh, so again, it's depending on the questions that you want to see, um, uh, if you are interested in intracellular mechanism, you will go for perforated patch uh, instead of um, whole cell. So if now you want to uh, record from, um, uh, from single neurons and use intracellular recordings using microelectrodes. So what you are doing is you insert an um, uh, electrode inside the cell. So compared to the uh, patch electrodes you, where you get in, con in close contact of the cell and form a gigacell, with uh, intracellular recording with microelectrode, you go inside the cell, usually with, uh, with uh, a buzz. So you measure the voltage across the neuronal membrane and you have, again, a high signal-to-noise ratio. And, uh, and this technique um, is really, uh, will give you a very long recordings of action potential and synaptic potentials. Um, this is a technique that is mainly used in my lab. And, um, and we use microelectrode of 0.1 micrometer, so it's much smaller than uh, the patch electrodes that were uh, one micromolar, and therefore um, they, are in, uh, they have um, higher resistance, which is about 120 mega ohm. And with this technique, you are able to record from slices up to 500 micrometer, and this is the reason why we are interested in this technique particularly, because with 500 microliter, you can conserve much more um, intact circuitry compared to um, two-patch recordings where you have only 300 to 350 micron of, um, of uh, slices. So you can, um, the main advantage um, for those who have done uh, patch uh, recording is with uh, a recording with microelectrodes, you can use multiple recordings with one electrode. So for patch recordings, every time you want to patch a cell, you will have to change your electrodes. Um, uh, with uh, sharp electrodes, you can just uh, go inside multiple cells and just uh, carry on with uh, the recordings. 
The disadvantage of this um, technique is um, that it blinds recordings. So you don't see the cells, you don't know where you are uh, recording from, and uh, when you record the neurons, you will be able to see if you record from a pyramidal cell or an internal neuron, uh, depending on the, um, the electrical properties that you can see, but you will not be able to see um, where you are in the, uh, the slice, and you will not be able to, to see which type of neuron you're recording. So this is really um, uh, an example of a, a slice into an interface chamber, and this is what you see. So um, really what we need, what we're trying to do is to aim, to aim the electrodes on the region that we are, um, we are interested in, and then record from two uh, neurons and uh, try to find the connections between the two. So basically, we're just recording for one neuron, um, uh, let's say a pyramidal cell, and then just poke around with the electrodes until you find a connection. Um, I have to say that this technique is very hard, and there is not many people who, who are doing it because uh, because it's um, it's uh, blind recording. So you have to uh, really spend a lot of time um, trying to find those connections. So it's one thing to find one neurons, but we want paired recordings, so we want to find two neurons that are connected to each other, and. Um, the only way that we can uh, um, recognize or trying to characterize this interneuron are to fill them. So while you, um, you record from the cell, the current that you're injecting inside the cell um, will, um, will uh, transfer a dye that is, uh, that is in, inside the, the pipette inside the cell, and you will, um, you will then be able to, uh, to go into uh, anatomical studies. So the different type, yeah? They usually not far from each other. With uh, sharp electrodes, we don't go very far from it, like each other because uh, this, uh, this type of recordings will not, uh, will not work or, or because the, um, the signal is, is, the noise is a bit uh, uh, higher than with the patch. Therefore, that if you have uh, two cells that are too far from each other, the uh, EPSP or IPSP that you will be able to record will be so small that you will not be able to see it. So usually we go like from cells that are maybe 100 micron apart, but not, not further than that. Sorry? The voltage the current? Well, we measure the voltage, yeah. Um, so, uh, so you are able to, um, to fill the cell with any dye that you want. So you can use either HRP, Lucifer yellow, biocytin, or neurobiotin. So in, in uh, 1988, William um, Armstrong just came up with uh, the biocytin staining, which is probably the, um, the best staining that you can have to, um, to really, if you want to look at the anatomy of the cell. And, uh, and, uh, and this is really the uh, biocytin is the dye that is, uh, that is used um, um, more widely. Lucifer yellow um, is, uh, is, um, is not as good, and, uh, but it's usually or sometimes used for the recordings of gap junctions because they will be able to go from uh, one cell to the other. So how do we combine these um, electrical uh, recordings uh, with uh, some reconstruction on anatomy? So we, we um, fill the cell with biocytin and then we take it to the histology. For each Interneurons that we are recording, uh, we, uh, we want to characterize them, and, uh, and to do that, we're looking at the um, calcium binding proteins. So I don't know how much you know about the different type of interneurons in the cortex and the hippocampus. So you will have more than 21 types of interneurons, and, um, and uh, uh, this characterization is really um, uh, um, sole subject in 
uh, for neuroscientists because how can you characterize every single um, uh, inside neurons and one um, uh, aspect of those uh, inside neurons or those, uh, this uh, characterization is to look at the calcium binding proteins inside the inside neurons. So for each um, uh, neuron or inside neurons that we, uh, we record from, we can do some fluorescence. So we can choose, uh, this is a biocytin inside uh, a cell body and we can choose depending on the firing pattern of the cells, we, um, we are uh, choosing some calcium binding protein and just see if uh, the, they, um, they have it in their um, cell bodies. And then um, the slice uh, goes through the HRP protocol where you are able to visualize the cell with uh, uh, immuno, well, it's a peroxidase uh, protocol. And from there, we are able to reconstruct the cell either in 2D. So this is um, a, a, a reconstruction of the cells by hands. And, uh, and this takes a, a very, very long time. So for, um, for a pair, um, you have to count uh, up to two weeks to finish to, uh, to draw uh, a pyramid and an internal neurons uh, together. And this is a drawing tube, so literally you just, you just um, go through the, um, uh, look down the microscopes and you can see the cell and you can see your pen and you can actually just follow the contour of the cell and you are able to, uh, to draw the dendrites and the axons of the cell. And you can also um, uh, look for putative contacts between the axon of the, the pre and the postsynaptic interneuron if you're looking at a pyramidal cell to interneurons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just, uh, it just, you're looking at the cell. So you have this, um, this, um, this dye inside the cell. So you're just literally just looking at the cell and just draw it. And we are able to do it with a drawing tube, but also we can do 3D reconstruction of the cell using uh, Neurolucida. It doesn't look very good. It actually looks better at, at the back there. Um, we are able to, um, to do uh, neurolucida drawings of, um, of the cell. I don't know if you're going to see it. This is, at the moment, we're trying to get um, uh, an, an open access database of the 3D reconstructions that we have. But this is a reconstruction of a, a axoaxonic cell in the cortex, in the hippocampus. Stops. And we are able to draw the cells uh, 3D and to really make, uh, um, uh, oh, here we go, start again. Um, we are able to really draw like the cells uh, with a very, very, very high definition. So if you, doesn't seem to work. We are able to draw the axons, so we are able to draw the boutons, we are able to draw like the, the, uh, the uh, thickness of the axon because this is a very important parameter, parameters that uh, should be looked at depending on the thickness of the, ax, uh, the axon. You will have the transmission of the neural activity either faster or slower depending if there is myelin or not. So it's something that we would like to do. And, um, and with this uh, drawings, we would like to, um, to have an open access database where we will have the, uh, the 3D drawings correlated with the electrophysiological properties of the neurons, with, uh, with uh, the uh, firing pattern of the, uh, the axon, the, the, the cell, and the type of the connection. So with, is this cell connected to, um, to another cell and just be able to, um, to do it that way? It's supposed to work better, sorry. Okay. So 
this is the same for the uh, 3D reconstruction. So for, from um, those uh, reconstruction or those anatomy, we are able to get some, um, to, uh, to know or to try to find the putative contacts with the, the cells. So we are trying to see how many synapses they form with a, like, you know, specific connections, and we are able to um, take it into EM. So those um, here, I mean, the, this particular example there are gap junctions between two cells. So we were able to record with sharp electrode two pyramidal cells, um, here in, in blue and the other one in, in, uh, in black. Those two uh, cells are connected with a gap junction. So when you um, inject some current into one, you get uh, your, that elicit um, uh, spikelets into the other. And this type of recordings, because the, the cells have been filled with biocytin, you uh, can take it into EM and just look at the ultra structure between the two and just to decide if the putative contact that you saw when you draw the cell is actually an actual um, um, contact between the two cells. So from those type of recordings, uh, we are able to, um, to get the, uh, the electro well, electrophysiological properties of the cell, so the fine pattern, the different type of connections. We are able to, um, to draw the anatomy of the cells and to be able to, uh, to find the, the putative contacts between those neurons and just to decide how many synapses are um, involved in this particular type of um, connections. And finally, um, the uh, ultimate uh, resolution on how to record a cell uh, with uh, two photon imaging or optical imaging and stimulation technology. So the technology are just getting finer and with the two photo imaging you, um, you are able to record or to photo stimulate um, some uh, neurons and be able to see the ultrastructure of the cell in a very, very high resolution. So this is a recording of a cell. So there is some uh, fluorescence die inside the electrodes that fill like the entire neurons in, um, in slices and um, you are able to see um, to see very um, high definition. I think you can go up to one millimeter into a slice um, uh, with a two photo imaging so you are able to, uh, to see um, spines in the dendrites. And from there, you are able to uh, photostimulate different parts of the dendrite. So, for example, here, those are, this are, uh, is a, a dendrite with different spines. So it doesn't come out very well, but each point here, like one, two, three, four, until eight, um, is a location of a spine in, um, on the dendrites. And you are able to decide what you want to activate. So for example, if you photo stimulate this point number four, you are able to, um, to get the recordings at position four, for example, and get the average out of that. But you can also do random recordings at different points to the dendrites, and that will give you um, uh, recordings at different, at different locations and, uh, and trying to explain how um, uh, a synapse, um, if a synapse is at this point against this point, what is the difference in the type of recordings, which uh, channels are activated, and so on. So this uh, two photo imaging or photo stimulation with two photon is, um, is really ultimate technology and will be able to, uh, to activate or to record in a very, very specific location. And f yeah. It isn't. It isn't. No, it's just um, um, really 
you have different location, different uh, signups that will, uh, that will uh, respond differently. And that's what I mean for a model, nothing is very like, uniform. So even in that part of the dendrite, this is not a long dendrite. At different points, different, depending on, on the, the active excitation, at different points on the dendrite, you will have different responses. And uh, finally, the um, uh, uh, configuration, which is the optogenetic. So um, uh, scientists are more in favor now to stimulate or to try to photo, like stimulate um, the cells uh, um, instead of uh, using some uh, stimulation or electrical stimulation. When you use electrical stimulation, you usually have artifacts and that will increase the noise. So the uh, new generation of um, activation or inhibition is done by um, a photostimulation and by photocurrents. So you have some neurons that will be uh, genetically modified with a light sensitive ion channel. So either channel rhodopsin if you want to activate a cell with lights as done here. So when the, the light is on here, you'll be able to, um, to elicit some uh, um, action potential. And on the other hand, if a cell uh, contain um, halorhodopsin, which is a chloride channel, you will be able to inactivate the cell uh, by photocurrents. So this type of uh, activation inhibition by photocurrents is, uh, is really uh, is, uh, used very widely um, now for photostimulation, either in vivo and in vitro. You can uh, activate the cell in, vi in vivo as well. So this is uh, one of my recordings. So you can do it on slices and uh, and add it to um, to the uh, anatomy. So if you um, shine the lights onto your cells, you are able to uh, elicit action potential. So um, in terms of uh, connectivity or the connections that you can uh, you can record. Um, here is a, a picture of the hippocampus. The red dot here is the, uh, the interneurons that I'm recording from, which is uh, shown here. And you are able to elicit the light at different location into your slice and record from, uh, from different locations. So, for example, here it's uh, um, an interneuron in the CA2 region, and uh, when you shine the light in the pyramidal cell layer in the hippocampus in CA2, you have uh, uh, no response, and when you shine the light in CA3, you get a response. So, in terms of connections, you can actually um, um, look at it and, and, uh, and be able to photoactivate those, uh, those, uh, those cells. The um, really disadvantage of this, uh, of this uh, method is uh, you are not very specific of what you stimulate. So the laser is, uh, the diameter of the laser will be quite high, so you will not be able to, to stimulate one only one cell at a time. So you will have uh, 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 recordings of uh, different cells um, at, uh, at particular locations. And that's really um, gone to uh, the ultimate um, electrophysiological recording in vivo, which is called all optical electrophysiology, where they are able to manipulate the cells with, um, by um, either get um, trying to, um, to take uh, activation probes like channel rhodopsin or uh, inactivation probes um, like allorhodopsin. They are able to visualize the cells with one photo or two photos, so they get the really high resolution of, uh, of this uh, two-photon imaging. And they are able to record um, the um, calcium uh, to, to do calcium imaging and to record the voltage at the same time and uh, using one photo or two photons. So this is really the 
ultimate um, uh, techniques where you uh, you can uh, manipulate the cell in vivo and be able to record from the cell and stimulate at the same time. So to give you an example for this type of cell, they are able to, um, to have an indication of the calcium level at the slice. They are able to uh, record from the voltage. They are able to stimulate the cell and look at the uh, response of the, the cell and um, ultimately they can do postdoc analysis where they look at the uh, fluorescence and, uh, and the type of uh, the different fluorescence that uh, they want from that particular neurons. So this is really the, the different type of recording that you have. And depending on the question that you want to answer, you will be able to decide which technique um, uh, you want to use. But mainly I just would like to, well, to say that those uh, recordings are um, time uh, consuming. So it will depend uh, the, the nicest um, uh, recording will be really depending on the electrodes. So uh, uh, if you don't have the good electrodes, your recording will, uh, will not be good. It depends on the seal um, that you get. It depends on the, the, uh, the duration of your recording. So the longer you will record your, your, uh, yourself from, the better staining yeah, you're going you're gonna to get. And, um, and for the uh, sharp electrode, we are able to record for uh, maybe uh, up to three hours. So then we are able to, do, uh, to get the recordings and do some pharmacology and get uh, all this data from uh, one type of um, experiments. So tomorrow I will go through which type of data that you can uh, get from those experiments. So uh, from the uh, electrophysiology point of view and the um, anatomy, um, uh, anatomical properties that you will, uh, you will have and will get from those um, techniques. Thank you. No, this is real data. <laughs> No, no, we just really just all we like we want is just to try to find two cells recording, uh, like recorded together and just to look at the type of collections. At the moment, it's, um, it's, very, uh, it's very vague which cells are like connected to each other and this is just no, no statistical at all. What we are looking at is recording from two neurons and looking at that particular type of connection. So is that neuron is connected to, um, to this type of, uh, of interneuron or, or pyramidal cells? And, uh, and what does this particular connection does? You don't like this idea that there is no statistics. Right. right. <laughs> You're looking at what happens in a single neuron or maybe two neurons, uh, and this is very difficult. And I, I love the pictures. They were very pretty. And they, they show a lot about what the neuron does. Um, uh, in a brain, though, there's 10 to the power 11. Do, do you think you will be able, maybe at a later stage, uh, uh, to be able to, to look at multiple neurons and how they interact, how they might synchronize? Uh, well, we, we are future? able to do triple recordings. But that's, that's about that it. Mean? Triple recording. So you have three electrodes at okay. the same time. So, um, but we are able to, to do my, like really mini circuits. Mm -hmm. That means that when we record from a, a pair of neurons, you, if, if the two cells are, are well and uh, you can keep one and just try to find another one around it. 
therefore that you are able to try to to see like what's going on in the neighbors like right. hemorrhoid cells so you can look at the pair interaction between one neuron and its neighbors yeah okay. yeah i mean there are some some now for patch recordings um, you can i think there is 20 you can have 20 electrodes at the same time so they can they can record from 20 cells at the same time okay. and just to see like what's what's going on very nice thanks If you want to model the interaction between the synaptic interaction between two neurons, then you can use some statistics. There are yes. some yeah. stochastic models of yeah, quantum yeah. release and yeah, yeah. things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, well, I mean, tomorrow I will, I will really look, like, show you the data and what we, can, what we get from the data, really. So, and, uh, and we are able to, to model, model that. You can have, um, we use a binomial no model just and, uh, and just try to, uh, to answer this question like that. Questions? You have showed a uh, gap junction, an experiment with the gap junction. Mm -hmm. In your experience, uh, how prevalent and how import, important are the gap junctions in the cortex or hippocampus? Are they important? Is uh, that your question? Yes, yes, they are very important. Yeah, they are. They are. They are really important. So, like gap junction between the, the pyramidal cell in, in, in the brain are very important, and uh, and um, the it's all about timing. So how the uh, those neurons will be uh, will be coupled like with gap junctions, but they also are connected somatically to other cells. And, uh, and then, uh, if you think of a model, you will have to, to think about the propagation of the transmission will be much faster if you have gap junction between the neurons rather than just synapse. Okay. But they are, they are very important, yeah. Are the gap junctions between the cell bodies or the dendrites? We or? didn't see. We we looked at pyramidal cell pyramids, pyramid mm -hmm. pyramids. Usually, um, the gap junction uh, are shown uh, between interneurons. So interneurons are coupled with gap junctions. But we, uh, in this particular um, uh, experiment, we were looking at the existence of uh, gap junction between pyramids, uh, pyramidal cell in CA1, and they were not they were not in a cell body that were in the dendrite. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't see any axon-axon coupling at mm -hmm. all. And, uh, and it does make sense because when we record from them, the spikelet is actually quite big. The ratio between the two is, is, uh, is big compared to what is seen in... in Can example. you say something quantitatively? Do you see, I don't know, how many gap junctions compared to synapses? It's... Well, we uh, we think that uh, one uh, pyramidal cell is coupled to probably four around. So, in terms of uh, chains of um, of uh, transmission, it it will be very like it's very important. It will be really important in the circuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, one more question about uh, gap junctions. It's uh, among um, excitatory or inhibitory cells. Do you, do you have an idea? Well, they, they are more uh, prevalent in between inhib uh, inhibitory cells. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. It is, um, I think the hit rate was 100. One, uh, I think we were able to find a gap junction between pyramid pyramid in one out of 420 hits or something, which is, uh, which is very, very low. <laughs> Two questions. When you say gap junctions are, are important, mm -hmm. what do you mean exactly? And then do you have an idea why gap junctions are more prevalent between inhibitory cells? Why? 
why I don't well, know. Conjecture. Yeah, I don't know. Um, they are, but they exist. And, uh, and if you think that one cell is coupled to four or four other in the neighborhood, you will have a chain of action. So why is that important? Because if you have two cells that are connected by a cap junction, if one cell receives uh, uh, an action potential, um, that will um, that will transmit to the cell in like really no time because the gap junction are really fast. So you will be able to to have spikelets in the uh, in the second cells, and if the spikelets reach thresholds, it will be able to um, to transmit or to elicit uh, um, action potential in that uh, second cell. And if that second cell is coupled with a gap junction to another cell, you will have transmission of the, uh, of the uh, neuronal activity from one cell to the other. But each of the cells are also coupled synaptically to interneurons and pyramidal cells. So you will need to have on the circuits um, some fast transmission as well as a, 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 a slower transmission. It's um, 10 times faster. Yeah. No more questions? Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. You just, um, do you have any idea of how they developed the gap sections, how they form? Is, yeah, uh, is well, there any theory, any idea of? Well, you have, uh, well, in the, um, in the uh, interneurons, you will have some, some channel co uh, connection, and, uh, and we think that uh, um, um, between pyramidal cells, um, those connections are not there, and, uh, and some other channels are forming uh, the gap junction, but this is very speculative. Um, they think that channels called panexin are maybe involved, but uh, is something that uh, that is uh, is something to to be tested. Um, studying gap junction with sharp electrodes, I have to say, is the toughest thing that you can do because you have to be really, really close to each other, and um, and uh, and that was uh, a very, very hard experiments uh, to um, to to do, but. Um, we, uh, we managed to have this, um, sometimes we actually just uh, impaled the same cell with uh, the two electrodes, and, uh, but that's happened uh, um, a lot of time. But the hit rate, as I said, was one in 400. So, so we had to test 400 pairs to find one connection. So this is very, very low. Thank you. Uh, you first presented the MEA as a technique of uh, multi-neuronal recording, right? And then afterwards, the, the, there was the, the microelectrode for just one, cell, one mm -hmm. cell recording. Is there any probability that with M MEA, you get a signal from a single cell one in one of the electrodes? Well, you could, but those electrodes are quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite big in diameter. So, so compared to, uh, to sharp electrodes or, or to patch, it will be different. But uh, mainly is to record from a, a population of cells. But probably, yeah, the technology just going fast. So, I mean, the 4,000 for like 96 electrodes is, uh, is really the, uh, the maximum that you can get. But the amount of data that you will get from those 4,000 cells uh, are um, immense, really. If I can comment on that, you can sort the spikes. So yes. yeah, yeah. you can yeah. extract single neuron information from multi-neuron recordings in good cases. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, well, tomorrow I will show you. I am. Um, uh, um, we can um, do farming patterns. We're looking at interspact interval. You can um, look at the um, the um, IH currents in those cells. You can uh, have a look at the APSP, IPSP, and the uh, the width of these uh, these connections. And uh, and in terms of really um, uh, neuron activity, you, you different connection will have. Uh, will be like different and some are depressing, some are facilitating, so you just get um, uh, all sort of data that you can get from those experiments. Are your reconstructions made available in ba databases like uh, neuromorph.org or uh, ModoDB? Some, some, uh, some are, are already on, uh, in uh, Neuromorph and um, but we uh, we now would like to um, to do this uh, open database uh, specifically for uh, for this type of uh, reconstructions. So our reconstruction are, are uh, times hundreds, so it's like much higher resolution. That's what you can get now. I mean the um, Allen Brain like um, um, database or the uh, Neuromorph are usually um, don't uh, use this um, high resolution. So the neurons would be uh, would be reconstructed in like times 40. So y you get the the morphology of the cells, but you're losing on the on the resolution of it because if you go if you don't go times 100, you will not be able to see the bouton. You're not going to be able to to spines and so on. So it just uh, and that this is what we want to uh, to be able to, to to do in the model. If um, spines are important. Yeah. Myelin is important. I mean, the like neuronal activity will be different if if you don't have that in the, in in like any reconstruction that are are used. So um, so we're trying to to get the, the reconstruction. We're trying to get the uh, the correlated electrophysiology. So you know exactly for this type of connections you have the. Um, this type of um, EPSP or this type of uh, really physiological properties and, uh, and then you can try to build up like a, a database where you have a collection of the different kind of, of connections that you can get. And, uh, but at the moment we have data from rats and we have data from cats in the cortex. And, uh, What's the error? Um, somatosensory, yeah, and um, so we can, we can, we're hoping to um, to do um, to do this uh, open access, so everybody can access it. Open, uh, everybody can open without like a specialist software, and we'll be able to access those data um, because uh, they're beautiful reconstructions, and uh, and uh, and at the moment some of the reconstructions that are on. <coughs> on this uh, database are really the axon is cut or, or you really losing a lot of information. So, but this is depending on the techniques that you're using. It's patch. You only will have uh, slices with 300 micrometers. So you will lose some of the axon. You will lose some of the dendrites. So um, if you go up to 500, so you have much chance. So it's much likely to be, to be really preserved and... Uh, and uh, and be able to to have uh, as much information as you can be you can have the beautiful cell you showed this uh, ax axonic cell would you say that's the same as a chandelier cell or is yes it? yeah uh -huh. yeah so ax axonic um, well, we can characterize exosonic in, in those ones are from the hippocampus. So mm -hmm. it's much easier because you have mm -hmm. the pyramidal cell layers. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, this axon will be just at the top, like mm -hmm. laying on the top. Um, in the cortex, as you know, it's, it's much um, difficult to characterize mm -hmm. the cells. So unless you have the connections and you have the two cells together, you mm -hmm. will not be able to characterize the cells. So I, didn't, and, I didn't until. see this chandelier-like... Um, processes which 
Yeah, it's probably uh, but maybe it's just was a yeah, that's of yeah, that, that cell really. So it's just uh, uh, we have different type, like different mm -hmm. examples. But um, in terms of yeah, I mean it's it's hard to characterize those interneurons, and and in the cortex is even harder because you don't have these layers, so you have to to be able to know the the target of the cells to be able to characterize fully each type of interneurons. No questions for now. So anyway, we'll have two more lectures, so more occasions to ask questions. So let us thank uh, Audrey again. And <laughs> so we start the, the afternoon second session. Uh, we, we started with a kind of uh, hardcore neurophysiology, and we will jump to the, to the other side with uh, the maths of uh, the networks. Uh, with uh, Remco, uh, coming from Holland. And uh, so he's one of the, the organizers of uh, this uh, workshop. And I think he will give three lectures total, like uh, Audrey. So, Remco. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity to speak here. This is a bit different for me. Normally, I give talks in front of an audience that is either mathematicians that we already consider to be a broad audience uh, or probabilists, which we call a specialized audience. Now, this is a much broader audience. I've very much tried my best to make my lecture accessible also to people who do not have a very strong math background. But if you do have questions, um, ask them. And I will start with a similar apology as Audrey started with uh, earlier on. I am a mathematician. I don't know much about the brain. I know a little bit. I've spent quite a bit of time trying to understand important aspects of the brain, but I certainly am not a specialist in that area. Still, I'm hoping that uh, ideas in, in probability theory can actually help uh, to, to increase our understanding of the brain. And let me, uh, let me try to do this as a metaphor, because I'll be talking about networks. Um, in many cases, one is tempted to try to understand um, certain principles from the individual. Uh, think about, for example, a firefly. Now, one of the things we know about fireflies is that they tend to blink in synchrony. If you just you look at one firefly, you will not be able to observe that because one firefly always blinks in synchrony with itself, right? But somehow they stimulate each other in order to start blinking in synchrony. And that really is a sort of a population perspective. It's a, it's a perspective not from the individual, but from the whole crowd. And it's not entirely clear how this happens. And similar aspects you might be able to see, maybe in the brain, by looking at, uh, at the brain not at a, as a single uh, neuron, but as the brain as a huge collection of neurons, or maybe at a higher level, uh, uh, different functionality uh, uh, aspects. Um, and that might actually tell you a different story from looking at a single neuron by itself, which, of course, is also very fascinating. And I really love the beautiful pictures uh, uh, that we saw earlier on. All right. So I'll be looking more at the high-level perspective. And uh, my course is organized in, in three lectures. What I'll be talking about today is, is I'll explain a little bit about complex networks in general. So complex networks are not only used for the brain, but they're used for all sorts of other things. And one of the peculiar things is that many of these networks that come from completely different origins, they share similarities. And that's something that I would like to describe today. And I would also like to give one example just to illustrate how math can help you understanding very basic aspects. And this is called the friendship paradox. And I would actually like to, to work that out in a mathematical way just to see how math can help you. Just an abstract perspective. Uh, but I will also talk about the brain. What sort of networks do we see in the brain? What sort of networks are we measuring in the brain? And how do we translate that? And what has new, uh, a network science to tell us about these networks that we actually uh, are really observing? So that's what I'll be talking, today, talking about today. Uh, tomorrow, no, on Thursday, I will actually move on to the, the kind of probabilistic models that are being used in network theory, but also more specifically in uh, neuroscience, to model the brain. So I've also looked into the, the literature in neuroscience and picked out a few papers where they really try to model 
um, uh, the brain as a network in probabilistic terms, as a random graph. And then in my third lecture, I want to say something about the network's perspective to the functionality of the brain. What does it actually mean for a brain to work? If I think of the brain as being a, a gigantic network of 10 to the power 11 neurons, what does it mean for it to function? That's not so clear. Well, we'll give some partial answers to this, um, partly inspired by uh, uh, the work that some mathematicians have done on somehow how different components can interact with one another. Uh, uh, Antonio already talked about this uh, this morning, sort of statistical physics or thermodynamics, ESIC models and the likes. They can tell you something sort of at a very caricature-like level about why we observe phase transitions. And hopefully we will be able to do something similar with uh, the understanding of, of the functionality of the brain. So that's my uh, uh, grand scale picture. And of course that means that I have a lot to explain because I can imagine that some of these terms, you don't know what they are. Now, what is a complex network? What is a random graph? What does functionality mean? Okay? So uh, today uh, uh, the complex networks uh, are central and uh, so there is no modeling that is being done. So you could say that this is just uh, uh, data science, the analysis of the data that has been collected on the brain, and some high-level discussions about what does it mean to model. And that's, of course, important for a mathematician. I mean, what does a mathematical model mean? How close is that to reality? What can it tell us? How good can it be? And, of course, all models are wrong. So how do we deal with that in a good way? Yeah? All right. So networks of the brain. Of course, you can look at the brain at several levels. And uh, uh, when I started with this business, I, I, I thought about the neuronal level uh, mainly. Uh, so that means that we have 10 to the power 11 vertices, neurons. And uh, uh, I've been told that these have uh, an average of about uh, 10 to the power 4, 10,000 connections. Is that roughly correct, Audrey? Yeah? Okay. So that's, uh, I mean, in, in terms of networks, that's huge. When we compare this to, uh, for example, social network, and we have 7 billion people, and that we already consider to be a lot, uh, this is way larger, right? So, and of course, obtaining data about this network is, is virtually impossible. We've already heard how difficult it is to measure one single neuron. Now imagine trying to map 10 to the power 11 neurons and their connections between them. That's just virtually impossible. So that means that uh, in mathematical terms, we'll have to stay at a statically uh, more abstract level, just at an abstract level trying to model the kind of interactions we might see between neurons and then trying to understand what that might tell us about the brain. But that's not the only story that I will be talking about today. Because there, you can also look at the brain on a more functional level and then you're basically grouping parts of the brain together, for example, in terms of their uh, uh, functionality. Um, so this is related to the ano uh, anatomical uh, atlas of the brain. And, of course, also that is some kind of a network where you have certain uh, connectivity between different parts of the brain. And what I've been told or what I understand is that when you do EEG measurements, you're, you're somehow trying to get your hands upon this functionality of the brain. Now, doing EEG measurements also allows you to describe a network, and that will be part of my next transparency. So what are the features of this uh, neuronal level? Well, there are short timescales, and... You know, I just think about those as being stochastic processes on a network. So there's something happening, something moves about on this network, and we're trying to describe that. What are the laws governing this, uh, 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 such processes? On the long time scales, of course, this is very complicated because we actually know that the processes that act on the network actually change the network. This is called learning. Right? By sort of thinking about topics, you become better in doing it. For example, mathematicians become better at doing math, and that actually means that the, that the, uh, uh, the interactions uh, in the brain that are related to math are being strengthened. And this is typically an aspect that we forget about completely when doing network analysis. We think of these two things as being completely independent. We have a stochastic process on the network, and then we have the network. And of course, they're related, but they don't, I mean, the, the, the process doesn't really influence the network itself. Now, here it really is different. And that's very interesting on the one hand. On the other hand, it makes it much more difficult to, to do the modeling. So, the big question, 
uh, is what is a good network model for the brain and what is a good model for functionality of the brain. And that's all what I'll be focusing on in these three hours. All right. Now, uh, another way of constructing a network, and this is related to EEG data, so what you do is you put a number of uh, uh, measurement devices on the scalp and you, mo you, you just measure what the time series are. Now, that, of course, gives you a huge amount of data. And, and just earlier, we heard that you can actually do this with 4,096 um, measuring points. So that gives you 4,096 time series. That's a lot of data. Now, of course, making any sense of that data is very difficult. Now, what, what I'll be describing here is something that really is uh, being done in, in the neuroscience uh, uh, community. It's what they do is they... they, they describe some sort of measure of association between the different nodes that are being measured. This could be a correlation between the time series that you observe or something else. So that means that we've actually reduced the data from 4,096 time series to 4,096 times 4,095 divided by two numbers. Okay? Now you can actually... Describe that by a matrix. It's a pretty big matrix, but it's a matrix. And then people start using sort of mathematical tools to try to get some information out of that. So what is sometimes done is that they will look at these, these numbers, and often these are correlations. So correlations are some numbers between minus 1 and 1. And what is sometimes being done is that these numbers are being thresholded, basically making the data binary, either 0 or 1. And when the data is 0 or 1, you can think of it as being a network. An element which is 1 means that the connection between these two nodes is there. An element being 0 means that the connection is not there. So you have a very simple network. And then people try to use the, uh, the ideas that have been developed in network science to say something about these adjacency matrices and try to quantify them. Try to learn something from them. And there's a, there's a name to this, and I will get back to that at the end of the lecture. Now, of course, this is pretty tricky, because it's not so clear what the interpretation of these weights really is. And it's not at all clear what the interpretation of the thresholding is. And how do you deal with negative weights versus positive weights? And so there's a lot of, sort of thinking that you have to do in order to uh, interpret this data. But still, you can just see it as a, as, a, as a data set, and then you can try to analyze this data set and draw some useful conclusions out of that. And we'll get back to that at the end. But let's first um, go a little bit deeper into sort of what random graphs and complex networks might tell us about the brain. So this is a phrase that I've uh, taken from a paper by Cosima and Pulic, um, who quote the following thing. There is a dominant view that brains are not random and one should not use the term random graphs and networks for the brains. Okay? That's one side of the story. And then they continue. Without going into metaphysical debate, it can be safely assumed that brains, viewed either as complex de deterministic machines or as random objects, can benefit from use of statistical methods in their characterization. Now let's go back to the sort of the simplest example of randomness. I flip a coin. I can get heads or tails. Now if I have a very good description and I know precisely what I'm doing when tossing the coin, I can actually predict very carefully what the outcome will be. Doing that real time may be a bit harder, but you can do it. So there's a deterministic world. Yet we like to think about tossing a, a coin in terms of a random experiment where each of the two sides show up with equal probability. It's a very good model. It's very useful if you think about, uh, well, tossing a coin or card games or whatever. You know, there's a lot of determinism in life, but it's sometimes useful to actually model things use, using randomness. And that's actually the message that they're describing. So it may be useful whether the brain is random or not, it may be useful to look at it in terms of randomness. And it reminds me of the very first paper I wrote on networking, 
which was an attempt to model the Internet. And I sent that to, or we sent that to uh, a journal in electrical engineering. Our referee report was one sentence. The Internet is not a random graph. And of course, the referee was completely right. But the question is, is it useful to think about it as a random graph? And that question he didn't answer. All right. So I'm hoping that looking at the brain uh, in terms of random graphs might be useful. But of course, that's, that's a hypothesis that still needs to be tested. Now, I've already said this, but all models are wrong. That's in general true. But some models are more useful than others. Right? So this is what George Box, who actually invented this phrase, uh, says about this. He says, now it would be very remarkable if any system existing in the real world could be exactly represented by any simple model. Think again about flipping a coin or throwing a die. However, cunningly chosen, parsimonious models often do provide remarkably useful approximations. It actually works quite well thinking about throwing a die and thinking of each of the six sides coming up with equal probability. That allows you to do computations, for example, of games of chance. And these computations turn out to be rather useful. Um, so for such a model, there is no need to ask the question, is the model true? You don't even have to ask the question. If truth is to be the whole truth, the answer, answer must be no. You cannot build a random graph model for the brain that will be really true. But that's an irrelevant question, is his uh, phrase, because he says, the only question of interest is, is the model illuminating and useful? Can you draw some conclusions out of it that will help you understand the brain or throwing a die? And do you find that useful? If that is the case, then the model is useful, even though it's wrong. So our question now is, is how to cunningly choose a model for the brain network topology and its functionality. So that's the question that I would like to be addressing today and in the further couple of days. Now let's go one step back and let's step away from the brain and let's look at networks in general. Here are two pictures of what we call complex networks. Yeast interaction, or yeast protein interaction network, and here we see the internet topology. So the internet topology is one of these examples of a complex network that we're actually trying to understand using network theory. And the funny thing is that many of these networks that come from completely different origins, social science, biology, uh, electrical engineering, the World Wide Web is typically studied in computer science, uh, all of these examples, they turn out to share different aspects. And what are these aspects? Well, the first is what we call the scale-free paradigm. And the scale-free paradigm basically says that if you look at the amount of connectivity of the elements in your network, whatever these elements mean, they could be routers, but they could also be people, you see a high amount of variability in how many connections they have. Okay? So that's what is called the scale-free paradigm. So here you see two examples. They're plotted in a log-log scale. That means that actually the axes grow exponentially on both sides. And what you see is things that sort of look a little bit like a straight line. So this is a, a representation of the degree distribution, so the number of connections per uh, uh, element in the network in what is called the Internet Movie Database. So the elements are actors, and you draw an edge between two actors when they've co-played in the same movie. And on the right-hand side, what you see is a representation for what is called the autonomous systems in Internet. So there, the elements are what are called autonomous systems, so parts of the Internet that are governed by one <coughs> provider, and you draw a connection between two of these autonomous systems when actually there's a physical cable between these autonomous systems. And then you can count for every of the autonomous systems to how many other autonomous systems are you connected. And that would be the degree. And that is what is being plotted here in log-log scale. Now, the occurrence here of these straight line-ish uh, parts in these uh, pictures, that's, what, that's very closely related to what we call power laws. And power laws are ubiquitous in nature and uh, in this case, what you see is that if you look at the degree sequence of the graph, so you just count how many vertices, how many of your elements have degree 1, how many elements have degree 2, how many elements have degree 3, etc., for every value of the degree. You just count those numbers. And 
which is postulate that the dependence of these numbers, as k becomes big, we're typically interested in the, the elements in our network that have many connections, because these are probably important in the network, that this decays relatively slowly, like an inverse power of k. So that means that actually the vertices with highest degree have very high degree, whereas the majority of the vertices still has very low degree. That's precisely the kind of picture that we see here. Right? Here the majority of the vertices is here. The majority of actors has only few connections to other actors, but you have a few here on the right that have a humongous number of actor friends. And the same here. Now what you see, if I postulate a relation like this, and if I take the logarithm, which is exactly what is being plotted here, right? here we actually plot the logarithm of the numbers, and here we take the logarithm of the size of the number of connections, so the logarithm of the degree, in this case that would be the log of k. So if we draw the log of these numbers and postulate this uh, relation, you can just take the log and see that the log of this right-hand side will be the log of this constant c minus tau times the log of k. So what we see is a linear relationship between these numbers and the log of the degree. And that's precisely what you see here. Because here we draw the log of the number, and here we draw the log of the number of connections. So straight lines in such log-log plots correspond to relations that are approximately of this form. And that is called scale-free behavior. So it's called scale-free because in these kind of uh, settings, there's no typical scale. If I look at the, the height of Dutch men, they're sort of, on average, 184 or so. If I add and subtract 20 centimeters, I have the vast majority of the population. So you could say that 184 is a typical height of a Dutch man. Okay? Now, if I look at incomes, on the other hand, that doesn't quite work. So the, the modal income in the Netherlands, I've just looked it up, I think is 36,000 euros. But you have lots of people who earn 10 times that much, or 100 times as much. Sometimes even a thousand times that much. Maybe not many, but they do exist. So it doesn't really make much sense of thinking of the Netherlands as being a country where everybody earns 36,000. That doesn't work. But there's no typical scale. But if at every scale you have these rare individuals that will actually earn more than that amount. That is what is called the scale-free behavior. Okay? So that's one aspect that we see in many of these networks. Another aspect is that they tend to be small worlds. And a small world phenomenon can be translated in social networks by saying that you can actually go between two individuals in the network just using a, a very limited number of hops. So this is related to six degrees of separation. And they have done some experiments trying to figure out whether this is indeed true. This is not so easy, because how are we going to check whether everybody on this planet actually... For, for every pair of individuals on the planet, the number of connections you need between them is at most six or seven. That's not so easy. But there's a very easy way of, of somehow interpreting this number six. So if I do this in the Netherlands, I always say, you know, you probably know well, either the boss of the university or, let's say, the high school principal. Well, somebody who actually moves in different uh, circles than you do, higher circles. Now, that person probably, again, meets people who move in even higher circles. And you go a few steps higher, and in the Netherlands, you get to the king of the Netherlands or the former queen. Now, I can link to the, to the queen, the former queen, in two hops. I know that. Because I know a person that I've shaken hands to who has actually shaken hands with the queen. So, that's not going to be true for everybody. But I'm pretty sure that in the Netherlands the majority of people will be three or four handshakes away from the queen. And it will not be too difficult to figure out what the chain will be, because you really have to go into higher and higher circles. But if everybody is three steps away from the queen, then everybody is also th six steps away from each other. That's the whole picture. So that's the explanation of the small world paradigm from a very pragmatic point of view. So what we try to do in probability theory is come up with models that actually quantify this analysis. So this is small, but how small is it? 
And when I talk about complex networks, of course I'm, I'm making the, uh, the, the simple assumption that complex means the size is very large, means that I'm taking a limit of some parameter tending to infinity. That's the size of the network that I'm taking to infinity. And then I'm trying to understand as to how things grow or don't grow. So that's a mathematical hypothesis or a mathematical assumption. But it's an assumption that has worked out very well in the past. So why not? Bear with me. Okay. So these are two kinds of network statistics that I've been talking about. So the small world properties and the scale-free behavior. And it might not be obvious to you why this is relevant for the brain. But bear with me. This will become clear sooner. Soon. Other aspects that have been uh, proved to be very fruitful in network analysis is what is called clustering. And that's something that you can understand very well from a social science point of view. So clustering is just a proportion of your friends that also are friends of each other. Now that tends to be substantial in social networks. But in other networks, this is not so substantial. So for example, in the internet, the clustering is relatively low. Why? Well, if I have two routers and I already have a cable between them, and then I have a third router for which the first one is also connected to, now, of course I can build a cable between these other two routers, but it's not going to ha help the functionality of Internet very much, yet it is very expensive to put down the cable. So in Internet you typically do not have high amount of clustering. So it really depends on the kind of network that you're interested in, whether it has high clustering or whether it has low clustering. Another aspect is what is sometimes called assortativity, and that's the tendency of vertices with high degree to also be friends of one another, and also the vertices of low degree to be friend, friends of one another. So if I, have a, if I have an element in my network, a person who has a low degree, has few friends, the friends that he has, are these also people who, who have few friends? So in some networks this is the case, and in some networks this is not the case. If it is the case, then it's called an assortative network. So it's basically saying that people of a similar nature try to find one another. If it is not the case, then it's called disassortative. So the, let's say the very rich people try to find friends with very poor people. Something like that. Okay. Now, another thing that has been very crucial and very uh, useful in... Uh, in network science has been to think about um, network science as giving measures to compare vertices to one another. For example, to try to answer the question, is a person in important in the network or is he not important in the network? Think, for example, about a citation network where we have lots of papers that refer to one another. Now, we have some sort of feeling as to who are the important papers. These are typically the ones that get lots of citations. But are all the papers that receive lots of citations equally important? Or are they ones that are more important? How do, we, how do we quantify whether a paper is important or not? Now, this can be done in several ways. And these, are, these correspond to several centrality measures that also um, indicate what it means to be important. Are you important for connectivity properties? Or are you important for different properties? So the first one is, is about closeness centrality. And this measures for a certain individual within your network. It basically measures how close you are on average to everybody else. So a person with high closeness centrality is on average pretty close to everybody else. Now the second level of, uh, the second uh, notion of centrality is what is called between a centrality. And here you should really think of uh, these individuals that connect different communities. So since they're on the boundary of both the communities, they're very important for spreading knowledge between one community and the other. Therefore, they're very important, but in a different sense than closeness centrality. So this is called betweenness centrality. Um, so the betweenness is large for bottlenecks, the vertices that really separate different communities from one another. And the last centrality measure is a, a centrality measure that you're, at least in practice, very familiar to. This is called page rank. And page rank, for those of you who, who surfed on the web before Google, 
they know that PageRank really has done something because PageRank is the driving algorithm behind Google. And before Google, it was actually pretty difficult to search information on the web. Google has made that quite different, even though now there's also a commercial aspect to Google. But the very simple way of, of uh, uh, um, the Google PageRank algorithm is that you classify for every vertex, for every web page, because this is about the web, how important the page is. And you also categorize about what the page is. So these are called queries. And then what happens when you look something up in Google is you type in the query. Google looks inside its huge database of, it looks at all the pages that have that same query and then displays the, the one, those in, uh, in importance in terms of page rank. So the one that comes on top has the highest page rank, the second one has the second highest, etc. And I don't know what your experience is, but when I type something into Google, I get the answers that I typically want. And if I don't get the answers that I want, it means that I've typed in the wrong query. So it's not Google's fault, it's my fault. Yeah? So this has really revolutionized, well, not just searching in the web, but it also revolutionized the wallets of the two inventors of this algorithm, <laughs> Bryn and Page, they started the company because of this. They were actually doing their PhD. They never completed their PhD. Instead, they became filthily rich. Well, there's a cost for everything. Now, there is also a notion which is called small worldness, which I've seen in the neuroscience uh, community. And let me try to explain. So it's from a paper in 2008 by Humphreys and Gurney. And uh, uh, this is related to what I call a small world, but it's not only that. It somehow mixes the small world properties of the graph with the uh, average path links. So what they do is um, you have a certain network, for example, a network that is derived from the brain. I will say something about how that can be done a little later. And then you compute two quantities, this gamma and this uh, lambda. And this gamma describes the clustering coefficient, coefficient in your graph compared to the clustering coefficient in a similar graph, which is called the erdos renyi random graph, which I'll introduce uh, on Thursday. And this erdos renyi random graph basically has the same edge density. So you compute the two things, and you take the ratio. So this basically compares how the clustering coefficient in your network relates to the clustering coefficient of a completely random graph with the same edge density. Right? That might actually be a useful object. Then you can do the same thing with the average distances in the graph. So you look at the average distances inside your graph. Basically, for every pair of vertices, you compute the graph distance, and then you take the average over all possible pairs. That's what you do. That's what this top thing is. And again, you do the same thing for the erdos renyi random graph at the same edge density. And again, you divide the two on top of each other. So I have some sort of interpretation of what this object is. I have some sort of interpretation as to what that object is. Now, what they do is they actually take the ratio of the two, and then they say when this is large, then uh, uh, it is a small world. When this is small, it's not a small world. I'm not a big fan of the parameter, even though it has entered uh, neuroscience uh, literature uh, quite a bit, because I think it actually compares apples to pears. So this here, we're comparing two objects for two different graphs, and that I can understand. So you could say that, well, the graph that I'm looking at is either more or less of a small world than the completely random no model that you would get if you just fix the number of edges. That's what this says. This is the clustering. And this is the small worldness. But why take the ratio of those two? Not so clear what the interpretation of that parameter is. All right. So let me try to describe very briefly how am I doing with time? Who is, how much time do I have? 20 minutes. Okay. And let's, let's describe this. Because you may wonder, why, why is network science useful at all? And I'll do, do describe that by the following paradox. And I don't know whether this sounds familiar to, to you, but it certainly does for me. I always have the feeling that my friends have many more friends than I do. So if you all feel that, how is that possible? That seems a bit of a paradox. OK? 
Okay? So let's digest this paradox and describe it mathematically. So it actually comes from a paper uh, from 91, which is called Why Your Friends Have More Friends Than You Do. And this is what Wikipedia writes about it in the case of Twitter. The people a person follows almost certainly have more followers than they. This is because people are more likely to follow those who are popular than those who are not. So your friends typically tend to have more friends because if you're following them, probably many others are as well. Okay? That's Twitter. Now let's try to describe this mathematically. So I think of my network, my graph, as a graph in which sort of all the vertices have a, a certain number of friends. And again, I'm writing down this little nk, that's the number of individuals who have k friends. I do that for every value of k. Now suppose I draw a, a, an individual uniformly at random from my sample. I just think of that as being myself. I'm the average Joe. Yeah? Okay? So what is then the probability that this individual that I've drawn uniformly at random has k friends? Well, I've drawn it uniformly at random, so that probability is just the number of elements with k friends divided by the total number of elements. Because that's just going to be the proportion of people who have k friends. So that describes sort of my degree distribution if I'm considering myself to be a uniform element in this, uh, in this network. But that, of course, does not say anything about my friends. So... I can compute the average number of friends that we have. Now, what is that? Well, I just have to sum out over the all possible values of k of k times this probability. That's what is called an expectation in probability theory. And it's just, you can think of this as being a mean. So what this describes is the mean number of friends that uh, the individuals in my network have. And that's the same as twice the number of edges in my graph divided by n. That's just a formula for it, which you can compute. Now, what I'm trying to do is to compare this to you know, the, the number of friends that my friends have, on average. That's, of course, a little bit more difficult. So how should I model that? Well, again, Wikipedia gives an answer. Wikipedia says the average number of friends that a typical friend has can be modeled by choosing, uniformly at random, a friendship in the graph or an edge in the graph, a connection in the graph and an endpoint of that edge, and again calculating the degree of the selected endpoint. So this is again a mathematical model of what is called a random friend of a random individual. Okay? I'm not going to go into the details of how to compute what the average of this is, but you can do it. If you call this d star the degree that you're computing here, that's a random variable because I'm doing things uniformly at random, so depending on which edge I, I, I happen to choose, I will go, I'm going to get a different answer. But in average, it will always be the same. And if I compute this average, what I get is the average that I had before plus a little bit. And that little bit is related to the variance of the degree. So how much variation do you have? Now, variance is a measure of variation, and it's always positive. So that means that this expectation, this average, is larger than the other average. So that means your friends have more friends than you do. Okay? So this is a completely mathematical analysis. Now, when I read this, I wasn't very convinced because it actually does not do what I was describing. So I was thinking of myself as being an average Joe, you know, pulling myself from the population and describing how many friends I have. If I think of a random friend of mine, what I should do is draw any of my friends, if I have any, any of my friends uniformly at random and inspect the number of friends that that individual has. That's not the same as what is being described here. Okay? Is that clear? Okay? But again, you can do this analysis, and I'm not going to explain it. If you're interested, you can compute explicitly what this is, and again, you get that this average number is strictly larger than the average a number of friends that an individual has. So this is a mathematical analysis of this somehow seemingly paradox, which you can just explain using these expectations. So I use this as an example to describe how looking at things in an abstract way can help you understand phenomenon that we see in real-world networks. 
So I'm hoping that for the brain one can do something similar. And even if you haven't understood how this works, take home the message that viewing networks in an abstract fashion can be helpful to understand things that you observe in networks. That's the main point here. Any questions about this? Yes, right. Yeah. Now this is. This is an excellent point. Of course, when I would do this in front of a, a, an audience of social scientists, they would immediately start complaining, because it's not clear what a friendship means. I mean, somebody whom I would be calling my friend might not call me his friend, right? So then I'm in trouble, because I'm, I'm thinking about these networks as being what they call undirected networks. That means that if I'm a friend of somebody, then that person also sees me as, uh, me as a friend. Right? So this is a modeling assumption. But this is typically what takes place, for example, in Facebook or LinkedIn. Right? Somebody wants to be your friend, you accept, and then you decide to be friends. And this is symmetric. And then the edge is there, and then you can do this analysis. So this analysis in particular is true on Facebook or on LinkedIn, if you wish. Does that answer your question? Good. All right. Now let's get back to the brain, because I think that's why you've come here in the first place. All right, empirical brain networks. So I've, I've taken my inspiration from this paper, which is a, uh, a review in Nature Reviews uh, in 2009. And um, this explains why these notions that I've been introducing are relevant. So what they've done is they've looked in the literature on, um, on neuroscience, what sort of graph properties were consistently reported. <coughs> in the networks that were investigated. So, for example, these EEG networks, where you look at correlations between sort of the time series observed at different nodes, and you truncate, it gives you a graph, and then you investigate that graph. What the interpretation of this network is, is not so clear to me. But still, you can do the analysis. And when you do that, what people report is that these empirical brain networks consistently are small worlds, so distances in them is relatively small. They have a high amount of clustering, so that means that if one, for example, brain region is connected to another brain region, it's more likely that, these, that the, the, the two brain regions that I'm connected to are also connected to one another. That's what it means. They have highly variable degrees, so that's called the hub-like degree structure, where you have lots of variability, and in particular, you have vertices that have very high degrees, so meaning having many connections. And this is reported to be a power law degree sequence. So this is not what I've invented. This is what is being reported in the neuroscience literature. Um, these hubs, we typically think of them as being the important characters in, characters in our network. So if I do this for the, uh, for the mathematicians... I connect two mathematicians when they've collaborated on a paper. If you then look at the degree of a mathematician, it will just be the number of people that he's worked with, he or she. So if I look at that network, there's one individual that always, one individual that always stands out because this individual has worked with 510 other mathematicians. And in math, that's very rare. In different disciplines, you might have papers that are written by 500 people or even thousands of people. But in math, this is very rare. Papers are typically written alone, or with two, or with three. Four already becomes harder. Five is rare, and it also becomes exponentially more difficult to actually complete the paper. I don't know whether the mathematicians among us agree. But when you increase the numbers, it becomes much harder. So that means that papers are typically written by small groups. So having 500 collaborators is a lot. That person that has 500 collaborators is Erdős. And Erdős, of course, was very important in the development of mathematics. Not only because he solved some important problems, but also because he was able to give the right problem to the right young person. And that's a quality, that's a talent, I would say. So just by talking to a person, he was able to propose the right problem to this person, and this, problem, this person would then resolve it, and they would write the paper together. That's typically how he worked. That's quite uh, illustrative. 
But it shows that the, that the individuals in your network with a very high degree often play a very special role in the functionality that the network describes. And that, of course, we also expect here in the brain, that the individuals or the, the, the things that you're measuring, the things that your network describes, those things that have very many connections somehow play a crucial role in the functionality of the network which in this case would be the brain. Yes? What? So this is often regions. So you can think of EEG data computing the correlation between different nodes, positions on the scalp, thresholding this, that gives you a graph, and then doing network analysis of that graph. So I'm not modeling here. This is just data analysis. And the question, of course, is, what does this mean? And that I don't know. But if you have, uh, I don't know, 100 uh, yeah. what's the meaning of all this world? Yes, a very good point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think of these in terms of asymptotic properties, when the network tends to infinity. So for 10 to the power 11, I would be pretty happy. Yes. But with 66, I don't know. But this is what is being reported, for example, in this paper. Yeah. 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 So we saw a picture of an EEG this uh, earlier on. It was 66? Yeah. Dots. Now, if it's 4,096, well, that might already be in a better direction. But 66 is quite small. So this is an excellent question. It's a matter of interpretation. I mean, what do you mean with, let's say, hub-like degree structures when yeah. you have 66 elements? So what makes a hub? Maybe all of these huge amounts of papers are meaningless because they are speaking about the yeah. number. Excellent question. So you mentioned this morning that I was critical, and I am critical. But let me explain why it might actually be useful. So it's not only that they report these network properties, but what they also do is that they compare individuals with different characters, different backgrounds. For example, patients with Alzheimer to healthy people. Okay? Now, in an early stage, detecting Alzheimer is not very easy. So if you were to have a network-based way of quantifying that a person has al Alzheimer, that would be very easy, because doing an EEG is not that hard. So what they found is that this empirical analysis shows that the network topology out of these networks that we get, the 66 elements or 100 or 4,000, whatever, um, that the network topology is affected in patients with mental disorders, Alzheimer, schizophrenia. So what they report is that the small, wor small world nature diminishes, suggesting a loss of efficiency in brain functionality. So this sort of indirectly assumes that the brains which have short paths are efficient and therefore the individuals with such short paths are more intelligent. You can observe right? that in the yeah, I mean, this is, this is just data analysis, right? So let me explain again how this goes. You have 66 positions on the scalp. You have 66 time series. You have a way of associating, comparing two time series with one another. For example, some sort of a correlation between them. That gives you a matrix. This matrix is a matrix of 66 by 66. It doesn't make much sense to look at the diagonal, and typically it's symmetric. Correlation between A and B is the same as the correlation between B and A. So it's actually the upper triangular thing. If you compute correlations, these are numbers between minus 1 and 1. Okay? Now let's do the following. Threshold these numbers and replace the ones that are above the threshold by a 1 and the ones below the threshold by a 0. That gives us a binary matrix. And everywhere where I see a 1, I can think of that as the edge being there, the connection being there between these two regions. And if I have a 0, that the connection is not there. Now I have a network. Out of this network, I compute everything. Average path length, clustering, degree distribution, everything. 
So this is just data analysis. We haven't done anything. There's no modeling involved. If you see any difference in, in people having Alzheimer compared to healthy individuals, it might give you a way of, of early detection of Alzheimer. If that would be the case, that would, of course, be a, a major breakthrough. But I don't think that they're actually using this yet to detect Alzheimer. But this could be a way of, I mean, it could be an explanation as to why people might be interested in this. Of course, this whole step between, let's say, the, the time series, which is your raw data, to the network, correlation coefficients, thresholding, etc., that might actually not be the best way of approaching it. And there might be a better way. That I don't know. But this is a way, and if in this way you can see distinction between two different classes of patients, then that might be a, a real breakthrough. That's why people are doing this. So again, all of this is data analysis. I haven't started modeling yet. Despite the fact that I'm a mathematician, I'm skipping the modeling to Thursday. All right, this was what I wanted to say. <coughs> So I, I, I wonder what kind of uh, situation people were when they measured the, the graph. For instance, in the experiment performed by Claudia, you have a difference in degree when you watch a man walk in a uh, um, scrambled situation. I think it was in resting state. In resting Did state. It, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, another point is that I remember a paper by Chinese people who impressed me a lot mm -hmm. when we started writing the project, in which they um, I consider people who, uh, who got um, a stroke. Yep. They went to the key hospital in Beijing, and then yep. they, they did um, uh, fMRI. Yep. Immediately after, 10 days later, one month, uh, five fMRI, I guess, and then they used uh, the um, property of small world to characterize. So in, in the beginning, immediately after AVC, yeah. the small world property was still there, and 10 days later, it was gone. And they, they followed during the year, and as, as, uh, during this time, uh, during recovery, the small world property returned. I guess it was uh, connect local connectivity. But then the point that the, this graph had only... 20. Yep. And so, right. it, it's, it's uh, impressive. Yep. Uh, what am I to, to say about this? Uh, you're quite right. 20 is not n tending to infinity. It's difficult to interpret. Uh, yes. But yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a bit like statistics, right? Um, s certainly in, in medicine, you do a lot of statistics on the basis of small number of patients. I give treatment A to, to a group of 20 patients, treatment B to another group of 20 patients. Now, you could again say, it's only 20 people. Well, there might be information there. Right? I mean, it's not, it's not the case that when you have small numbers that you can't say anything. It becomes harder. Yes. The power of your tests, if you're doing a test, might be smaller. But still, you might be able to do something. I'm a bit more worried about the fact that there is no modeling involved, and therefore you cannot even talk about a power. So, I mean, what, what are you computing? And you're saying the small worldness increased or decreased, or is that significant? Well, you cannot say. You cannot say whether something, a change is significant without having a model. <coughs> well, there you go. So was it just noise that was being found? It's difficult to say no to that question when you don't have anything to compare to. But still, these are interesting finds that certainly deserve further uh, investigation. Also, uh, isn't the, the activity, the task that the the person which is being recorded important in this process? I mean, 
if you're in these five measures of the fMRI, uh, in one day the person is thinking about something and the other day thinking about yeah. a, a, another another thing. Now, I, I do assume that they're trying to make these reproducible and that therefore that the, the, the circumstances would be similar. So, I mean, there's no reason why that couldn't be. But of course, I mean, it could be that on, on one day the person is worrying a lot because he's just had a stroke and on day five... He, he, you know, may have been more in sync with himself. You don't know. So there should be some sort of noise there that you cannot rule out. And then the question, of course, is are you measuring the noise or are you measuring something that is really there? Right? That's not obvious. I have another question just about the, 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 the conclusions on the structure of the brain. Yep. Uh, was it true that in, in the... In the brain, uh, in the beginning, when you were talking about general characteristics of complex networks, yep. you said that some networks are like uh, high degree nodes are connected yep. only to high degrees and yep. low degrees. Uh, is this true in the brain? Yeah, this is related to this uh, hub like degree structure and uh, something that I didn't say much about the hubs having a rich club organization. That's how it's being phrased. And the, the interpretation of that is that. Uh, we think of the, the, the vertices in the network that have very high degree as being very important. Now, the question is, are they also connected to one another? And that's reported to be true in, in these kind of brain networks. And that's called rich club organization. And it's not just something that is investigated in the brain, but also in other examples. Yeah. Uh, why not use weighted matrix? What are the mathematical Excellent limitations? Question. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, I mean, in a certain sense, the, the, the one lesson that statistics tells you is that as soon as you start throwing away data, summarizing things, for example, a real number, summarizing it by it's larger than a threshold or smaller than a threshold, you will lose information, and therefore your conclusions will be less powerful. But then again, I mean, if you think about it, suppose I have this matrix... What to do with it? At least, I mean, the, the thresholding will give you a network. And on that network, you can use the methodology of network science. Then at least you have a bag of ideas that you can throw on top of it. And it might give you some answer. What happens if you have a bag of numbers? It's not so clear what to do with it. But I find it an excellent question. Maybe you should do something else completely. Maybe you should look at the minimal spanning trees or something like that that take the weights into account in a more clever way and then compare these things with one another. I don't know. In general, uh, I mean, this is a whole branch of mathematics where we're saying we have a network, we model the network with a random graph, we put edge weights on it, some sort of edge weight. I mean, if it's a spatial network, it could be distances. And then we're trying to compute, for example, the traveling salesman problem. I mean, how do I go between all the vertices in my graph in such a way that the sum of the weights is, is minimal? These kind of aspects are being treated in a mathematical way. But I haven't really seen that in the, in the neuroscience community. But then again, I mean, there's, what were you saying, 4,000 papers? I've certainly not seen all of them. So, I don't know. What? 450,000. Okay, well, certainly I haven't read all of those. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for the very nice presentation. I, I would have expected you to mention the connectome, and I didn't hear the word a single time during your presentation. Is there Excellent a reason? Question. No, there's no reason. Uh, no. So if you explain me what the connectome is, then I'll make the link. <laughs> ah, no, 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 no. I'm the mathematician here, right? <laughs> no, but I mean, it's a good point. I mean, there's lots of things that you can mention about the brain. And the human connectome and the human connectome problem is, is certainly very important. Yeah, in fact, I watch, I watch uh, much part of the presentation uh, seems to be, uh, I don't want to suggest that it is in everyone, but this topic is to a certain extent covered in Ross Bond's book. Yes, of and course. The brain, and yeah. the one about, uh, understanding the yes, the I have the first one, not the second one. Maybe you see that reflected in my presentation. But Olaf and a few others have been 
Yes. From the case with metal, so with the carpet, yep. those topics are either the same, just have the first slightly different ways? Yep. Yeah. So what is a connectome precisely? I, I hope I'm not uh, violating any definition, but I think it's the claim that everything that happens in the brain can be explained by the way its components are uh, connected. So and and you mean it, at a functional level? Yes, the, the connectome per se would be the set of all the connections, just as yeah. the genome is the set of all the, uh, 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 all the base are pairs you in your all DNA. The connections between all the 10 to the power 11 yes. neurons? Or? Yes, all the connections across all the neurons that would be, uh -huh. and perhaps even glial cells, and uh, we seem to keep discovering new, new functions for them. So all those connections, once assembled together, that would be the connectome. If that's yeah. going to explain how the brain works, that's a different story. But it's, it well, would, I will yeah. certainly not be explaining how the brain works yeah. because I'm a mathematician. I'm not a neuroscientist. I, I, I really don't claim to know anything in that direction. But what you're describing as a human connectome is what I describe here, the, sort of the neuronal level. You have 10 to the power 11 vertices, which are the neurons, and they are connected to one another. But, of course, we don't know how uh, because we cannot measure that. You can, in fact, even go to a sub level. You can get even ah. the synaptic and dendritic. Uh, right. yeah, so that's the kind of things that you're mapping on a sort of single or, or pair neuronal level. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, yet, I'm not entirely sure whether... So maybe I'm wrong here. I'm, I'm only a simple mathematician. Uh, but I think of brain functionality as being a collective property. So it's a collective property of 10 to the power 11 neurons. And of course, it's very useful to think about what one, neuro, what, what one neuron does. But I really think, like the metaphor of the, of the fireflies, that you need to look at the whole thing in unity in order to be able to understand anything about its functionality. Now, the two things are, of course, not separated, and both are very interesting. Let me draw another metaphor. You have quantum mechanics, you have classical mechanics. Now, both are extremely useful in describing physics at different length scales. So uh, quantum mechanics is more at an atom level. But we don't know how the quantum mechanical description will give rise to the classical mechanical description. Classical mechanics is about large numbers of molecules and how they interact. Quantum mechanics is about very few atoms and how they interact. Right? So again, here, if we understand what the relation is between small groups of neurons and how they collaborate, will we be able to explain the functionality of the brain? It's not clear. At least the example of quantum mechanics versus classical mechanics, it never worked. Einstein tried his whole life. Yeah, it's actually that I, I had to look at uh, this paper at the uh, review you mentioned, and I think he, I don't know, I didn't look into the details, so maybe I get something wrong, but I think that they mentioned that these um, connectivities and this structure of the network, it's actually measured at different scales. And I think they mentioned, for example, this particular case of the, of the worm of the C. elegans, yep. that I think that there is a detailed paper that they yes. make like a whole mapping of the whole there they connections between the whole, all pairs of neurons. Yeah, it's 40 neurons or something like that. Yes. 40? So I thought so. Oh, 200. Okay, 200. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That would form. Yeah, that would be the connectome of the yeah. of the worm. That's yeah. of course very interesting. Yeah. So, okay. And of course, I mean, you do have uh, these networks at different levels. So, and that's what I'm hinting at here. I mean, if you look at the neuronal level, you have lots of uh, uh, neurons, so lots of vertices. But you can look at a slightly higher level, micro columns. Or, or higher than that, or a functional level, so brain regions and how they are connected to one another. And, you know, each of these protect perspectives could be very useful. It's not clear what is the most useful way of looking at things. Either that I don't know. But I would certainly say that somehow the union of these different ways of looking at things is probably more useful than any of them separately. Uh, 
Uh, hi. Thanks for the, for the lecture. It was really interesting. One thing that we have been trying to do in the past few years, and we have been doing it, is to use um, verbal reports from, from, say, schizophrenic patients or bipolar patients, uh -huh. and then do graph analysis on this. Use every okay. word as a node, and then uh, and extract attributes, and then try to do differential diagnosis. And we can do that, actually, okay. uh, pretty well. We can also do it between Alzheimer's and <clears throat> mild cognitive. So that's like an association analysis? You ask patients whether two words are associated with uh, each other? We actually or? work on dream reports, uh, waking reports, memory from different periods. Okay. We show them pictures and ask them to tell a story, which is uh, a psychological test. Okay. Uh, we do a theory of mind. Uh, little stories. So, so we're actually exploring a variety of different... Uh, out of these experiments, you have a way of deducing from it a network. So, so it's, it's once I have, let's say I say, I ask you, well, how was your dream, the last, the, the last dream you can recall? And you give me a 40 words account. Yep. So I, gr I, make, I make it a graph yep. and I calculate the, the, the number of node, nodes, edges, loops, yep. blah, blah, blah. And then I crunch the numbers and I see that the numbers are significantly different from, say, between bipolar and schizophrenics. Oh. Uh, and then I can train, uh, I can do some machine learning and then I can have a classifier. And, and it, it actually, it's better than, than, than using the psychometric scales. Okay. Um, and we've got a, a few publications on this. But one problem that we have is that we have to compare graphs with different numbers of nodes. Ah, yes. That's and one, very one thing we've question. been doing to the horror of yeah. some of the people that have an opinion about this is to use a moving window. <laughs> so, window. So, for example, let's say I have one report that has 100 words, another one that has 30 words. I use a moving window of 30 words to compute these attributes, then I move it a little bit and I compute it again, then I take an average of that. Yeah. And that's been heavily criticized. I would like to have an, your opinion on how to yeah. actually compare graphs that, that have e either different number of nodes or yeah. number of edges. So this is a very important question in general, and uh, it's not easy. And I think actually it's one of the things that network analysis can help you with. Okay. Suppose you were to have a model of a network, for example, a critical Erdős Rinjewen graph. I don't know what the right model is, but suppose you would have that. Then it's very easy to, to increase the number of nodes, right? and then you can compare. Right? So this is somehow can be used as a predictive way. Um, if you have a way of classifying a, a network of a given size, you might be able to you know, extrapolate and create networks of a larger size. But this is very much a modeling approach. And how you should do this, that's a good question. And I would love to talk with you about that in more detail. Let me give you one example where we've uh, um, uh, solved a somewhat similar problem. And this is related to assortativity, which I've described before. And that's the definition of assortativity. So, I mean, it's a mathematical concept, and it's actually very simple. What you do is you take an edge from the graph, and you look at the degrees at two sides of the edge. That actually gives you a vector, a complete vector. The length of it will be the number of edges in your graph. And then you can look at the correlation between these two variables. Now, if you think as a statistician, you can just compute this correlation. Okay? That's called the assortativity coefficient. This can be positive, it can be negative. It's always a number in between minus one and one. Now, um, that's all very nice. But a correlation coefficient is based on the idea that you're measuring a correlation. And correlations are only well-defined when you're dealing with objects that have a finite variance. Otherwise, you might be in trouble. I mean, if you compute the correlation coefficients between two random variables, and that's the thing that the correlation coefficient should be trying to approximate, what you have to do is you compute the covariance between the two variables and you divide through by the square root of the variance. Now, this is not well-defined if the variance is infinity. Now, in these settings, what typically happens is that um, the variables that you're computing have infinite variance, or at least asymptotically infinite variance, if the scale-free behavior is true, and if the exponent that comes out of that takes a value that is smaller than 4, if I'm not mistaken. Right? This is reported in, in m much of the empirical literature. Now, what then happens is that actually this object this assortativity coefficient, as a function of the network size, will tend to zero. 
precisely your problem. That makes it impossible, for example, if I have a sample of the World Wide Web of size 100,000, to say that it's more or less assortative than a network of size a million. That's a problem. So that's all related to the fact that this, is, this, is, this object that we're computing here has infinite variance asymptotically, and therefore things will, detend, will tend to zero. Now, there's a way how you can resolve that by instead looking at uh, the order statistics, which are well-defined and which will approach some limit that is well-defined. And then that allows you to compare things of different size. Because if you're approaching some value, as n tends to infinity, then for n is 200,000, you're somewhere pretty close. And for n is a million, you're, you might even be closer. Right? So you, they're of the same order of magnitude, so you can compare. If one is a half and the other is a quarter, then you will call them different. But if both tend to zero, for example, like one over n, and one is a half, the other is a quarter, it's not clear how you should compare them. So that's a possible answer. Look for things that are independent of the size of the network and that will approach some limit as the size of the network tends to infinity. And then you can compare them for things that have different uh, network sizes. But then, of course, the question is, what is that thing that should be independent of network size? And that I don't know because I don't know your example uh, sufficiently well. Okay. We'll, yeah? we'll talk. Yeah, let's do that. More questions? No? So let's thank Hamco again and have a coffee.